And I know this week there's a lot to cover, and I'm glad you brought up the Harbaugh situation because, of course, any time a decision like that does not go the way that you would expect it to from that side of things, it's an immediate head call for the coach, right? And a guy like Harbaugh, you hear, you hear all these, you know, complaints about what Harbaugh did yesterday and you have to think to yourself listen it's, it's not Robert Sala out there in his second year or whatever with a with a growing team in the Jets we're talking about a seasoned veteran here one of the better coaches in the league in coach Harbaugh so I understand where you guys are coming from but you know it's baked in with the frustration obviously but with these games and we are no stranger to it just a week ago we sat after the uh, the, the Dolphins game and picked apart every single thing that the Bills could have done differently in order to win that game and unfortunately Unfortunately for us, that laundry list was about a yardstick long. I mean, I could have sat here for two days and talked about the things the Bills could have done differently to win that game. Ultimately, when the clock struck doubles or quadruple zeros, didn't go our way. And that's kind of how it went for Baltimore this past week. But I want to start right there because that's the that's the area that everybody wants to talk about today. I had heard varying perspectives on this and I wanted to get yours. I looked at it. And the fact that that game was even where it was, the way that the Ravens defense had been playing coming into this game, you had to be happy that even though that they had allowed that comeback to occur, they had still had the Bills to 20 points late in the fourth quarter. This is a Ravens team that going into Sunday was ranked 32nd in the league in total defense. I don't think anybody expected the Bills to be held to as few a points as they were held to at that point. I took it... I took it as, hey, Harbaugh looks at this perspective or this situation and says, we got Lamar Jackson, an MVP candidate right now. No one's playing better than him in the league, arguably. This is going to be our best chance to win the game because I truly don't have faith in our defense stopping Josh Allen the way the second half has gone. How did you see it? And how is the city of Baltimore kind of seeing it right now from a rational perspective? I know there's probably not many out there, but those that you've talk to or seen what's the rational heads kind of saying about the situation that occurred on the fourth down play in the game on Sunday. How do you think Marcus Peters is feeling about it? And I want to get into that too, because that, that to me still confuses me. I mean, he was losing it, but I'll let you have the floor here on both topics. Yeah. Well, you know, first and foremost, I love juice, man. That guy is an absolute baller. He's a ball hawk. He's back. He's healthy. He doesn't have a pitch count on him anymore. And at the same time, he let his emotions get the best of him. That was totally out of line. That was ridiculous. He had to be held back from John Harbaugh. Yeah. Again, I don't, dis- I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with what he was upset about. And, and by the way, he hasn't spoken on this yet. So I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think we can all probably agree that it was related to the decision on fourth and two. And, you know, look, I keep coming back to a graphic that I saw. I'm going to pull it up just so I can read it to you. I saw this graphic on Good Morning Football this morning. And this to me, while John obviously didn't have this graphic in front of him when he was making the decision, he knew that the game was trending in this direction. Here, Here it is. First five drives for the Bills. Three points, 63 total yards three first downs, two giveaways. Ravens defense, to your point, was playing exceptionally well given the expectation and the standards that they've set for themselves, not only in the early part of the season, but dating back to last year. Now, put last year in a different basket. You can't even compare the two because of the injury situation that they were dealt with. Um, Those were the first five drives. You can't ask for much more. The last five drives, I mean, here's the difference in the game right here. 20 total points compiled by the Bills. Last five drives, I'm talking here. 263 total yards to 63 in the first five. 19 first downs compared to three in the first five drives. And zero giveaways. Played clean football. That graphic right there, again, it was not in front of John Harbaugh, but he understood that Josh Allen and company was getting anything he wanted down the stretch. And it's it's pretty clear cut to me. John can get up and say all he wants, and he has. And I really admire the way that he backed not only his decision today in, in his Monday press conference and gave great logic that I understood. I understand, I understand the logic behind his decision. Doesn't doesn't mean I, I agree with it. Right. You know, I would I would have taken the points 
grab the goat. It's a chip in shot, right? For Justin Tucker. And all of a sudden, Buffalo, if they want to win, is forced to put up six in a monsoon with a couple minutes left in the game. Like, that to me, based on what I'd seen too, not okay, like I get it. They'd been really struggling, the defense had been in the second half. But to that point, Zach, they had they had allowed 20 total points to a Bills team that is supposed to be the most high-powered, full, all-around team in the entire league. Now, they've shown in, in recent weeks that they are human, but they can win games. Did that? Fi- By the way, you came on my show to, to preview this thing last week. We talked about that statistic. It's no longer, right? Now, now it you was got snapped. To get over. That's what kills me. That's what kills me, right? The Bills and all we had to talk about all week because we couldn't win the close game against Miami. And like you said, and like I was talking about, no, a million different reasons, right, as to why it didn't go down. But it didn't. And then we're talking about the 0-7 and 7, and 7 straight one-score games. Now the Baltimore Ravens are 0-7 and 7, and 7 straight one-score games. I did not know that going into it. That blew my mind after the fact to wind up figuring that out. But here's how I see it, Bobby, when it comes down to those two all right, with that play in particular, because we've been in this situation just last year. The Bills played the Tennessee Titans on Monday Night Football. They went for it. You got Josh Allen, the biggest freak when it comes to athleticism in the league at the quarterback position. You need one yard. Sean McDermott goes for it. He slips on his own two feet, doesn't get it. Everybody afterwards, why didn't you kick the field? Well, because we didn't get it. That's why you're arguing it. I loved the call. There was two things about this particular uh, moment for the Ravens that stood out to me. One, the play call. You got Lamar Jackson, who in that weather, like you were referring to, that game favored the Ravens, so you would think. They are the better running team by a mile. The Bills don't have a run game outside of Josh Allen. Not only was Lamar running the ball real well yesterday, but J.K. Dobbins, you know, I think he he had spurts in the game. It wasn't like he had a terrific day. He only had 22 yards on the ground. But there were times where you knew you had to respect him. And if you have that play-action game going with, with Lamar Jackson, the way he was running the ball, well, you, I mean, I, I misspoke, actually. J.K. Dobbins had 41 yards. I'm looking at his receiving yards, but you get the point. He could still become a threat in that situation. But the bigger threat is Lamar Jackson. You have him rolling out for that type of situation – Backing up 10 yards off the line of scrimmage to get the ball out, to me, the play call in general was a head scratcher. The other thing that I look at here is if you're John Harbaugh, the last thing that you are expecting is an interception. You're thinking the worst case scenario here is that you don't get it and the Bills have to go 98 yards in four minutes to get the job done. So if you're John Harbaugh, I know he's getting grilled, but out of all the analytics – that everybody likes to talk about and the mathematics that you put in to every single different scenario. The one thing I don't think anybody thought of, including me, because as I'm sitting back, you know, rocking in my chair, freaking out, I'm not expecting Lamar Jackson to throw a pick there, but he does. So where I do try and, and defend John Harbaugh here is he was thinking, one, our defense hasn't been able to stop anything this entire half. The odds of them going down and getting a field goal to tie it and bring it to overtime, if not go the distance and score a touchdown, are quite high if we base it on the sample size of the second half. But two, if, if I can score here, it makes it much harder for the Bills to win. If I can't score here, it makes it much harder for them to go down and take that lead. So when you're looking at it from your perspective, Bobby, is Lamar Jackson getting a ton of grief today for the fact that that ball was turned over, or, or is it more on John Harbaugh from the Ravens' perspective as, as far as why that, that situation wound up going the way it did and why it ultimately wound up costing the game? Who's getting the more blame today? Oh, Harbaugh. And it's okay. not even close, you know. But, like, when you really dissect the play, it was obviously poor execution, You can go all the way back to Greg Roman if you want and maybe even like poor strategizing, right? Like why, what, what was the play design? You know, what were you going for? And it was, it's hard to to see that until we talk to Greg and ask him this week, you know, and, and ask what, what was the vision there? Because it was blown up right away. Advantage Bill's D line. Both tackles were blown out. You know, Falele and, and Moses were totally beat. And Lamar was dead to rights. You know, so all of a sudden he's just in a situation where, yeah, he's got to throw off his back foot. And, you know, that's going to get ugly. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, Hey, Duvernay has been super special, but he's not winning you 50, 50 balls. That's just not his game. So well, especially when you like, have Lamar, I mean, that's not his strong suit, nor is it really anybody's. I think in Buffalo, we tend to think that it's doable because Josh Allen would be the guy to throw the dime off his back foot 20 yards behind the line of scrimmage. But you know, that isn't the way you're going to win a game. And that's why we were talking all last week after the Dolphins game, Jordan Poyer was the main difference in this one. That interception was huge. You get the ball back out to the 20, you take your time, you win the game the way you do with a, with a field goal to expire the clock, which here in Buffalo, and we'll talk about this later, um, uh, because we are so used to finding ways to lose games like that. The fact that Sean McDermott took it down to the final play was extraordinary and a real breath of fresh air for us. But Bobby, you know, as well as I, we were, I was just, you know, referring to it with us here uh, as Bills fans with the Dolphins game last week. At the end of the day, you can talk about Josh Allen missing the throw to McKenzie to win the game. You can talk about the missed field goal from Tyler Bass or the missed pick six from Matt Milano, all these different things. At the end of the day, Bobby, the Ravens were up 20 to three in this game and they come out in the second half. They don't score a point. And I think what Lamar Jackson was held to 60 under 60 yards in the second half through the air. I want to ask you, because I know the Bills D stepped up, but schematically, how much different could things have been between the second half and the first half to take the Ravens from being able to move down the field and put points up to quite literally not being able to do anything coming into this game highest scoring team in, in the league right now for the Baltimore Ravens. How in the hell did they go into the second half without the ability to put a single point up on the board? Because you can pick point, you can pinpoint on that play with Harbaugh all you want, but they still did not score a single point prior to that. And when you look at it, it's a, it's a full game. The whole second half, they were shut down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, you know, this is a, uh, unfortunately for Ravens nation, fortunately for, for Bill's mafia this morning, by the way, I just got to say, you guys traveled unbelievably so well. I know involved. this is no news to you guys. This is <laughs> yeah. old news to you guys. I know you traveled better than maybe anybody in the entire country. The amount of bills, and I felt right at home. You know, I got to let your audience know. I know you know. I'm an Albany guy. Yep. And so while Buffalo and Albany, we know as upstate and western New Yorkers, we know that if they're nowhere near each other, we still got that upstate New York blood. We still got that New York blood in us. And uh I felt right at home. I mean, they, these people were all over Baltimore. I live right in downtown. For those of you who know the area, I live in Fells Point. And uh, I'm telling you, from Thursday night on, Thursday night up until today, I was walking the dog this morning, and I ran into a bunch of, uh, um, you know, Bills fans. And it was incredible. So you guys were well, rep well represented. But the statistic that I bring up, five straight blown leads at home. It's becoming so much of a so somewhat of a theme. Uh, you don't want again. You don't want to bring in last season too much and, and speculate too much because it's different teams. Mm -hmm. But these have been, I mean, to give up 28 fourth quarter points to a Miami team that sure, okay, sure, kind of like Buffalo, they are high flying offensively speaking with playmakers on the outside and a and a dynamic quarterback. Not comparing to it to Josh whatsoever, but you know what I mean. Um, look, the lack of execution and. Hey, you got to tip your cap to Buffalo too. There was plenty. Ravens had plenty of opportunities. They failed to execute in a number of different scenarios in that second half. But the way that Buffalo has played this team in the Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen era is to be commended. I mean, what Matt Milano does is in space, specifically with that Lamar run. Uh, I believe it was on the left-hand side of the field, second half somehow wrapping him up, somehow finding a way to stay disciplined enough laterally yeah. is just exceptional. Um, I told the story to your audience, you know, when we first met up that I'm a big Tremaine Edmonds guy, just because I know the family a little bit and, and, and he's from the DMV and went to Virginia tech. I thought he played well. And uh, just overall, I thought it was a gutsy performance by the bills defense. They have, they're one of the few teams aside from, uh, I guess the dolphins cover zero attack from last year on Thursday night football. If you guys remember that, that has really ha had an answer for the Lamar Jackson led offense, maybe not in the first half yesterday, uh, but certainly in the second, and I got to give Leslie Frazier and, and company a lot, a lot of credit because uh, while the Ravens certainly hurt themselves with some self-inflicted wounds, um, and, and the inability to cash in after long time crunching kinds of drives, right? If you told me, dude, at the, at the, at the beginning of this game, 
that one, the Ravens would hold the Bills to 23 total points and possess the football for over 38 minutes, 17 more minutes than the Bills did. I would have told you, all right, mark that down as a win. Sure. But uh, it wasn't in the cards. And this is why the NFL is so extraordinary. Last week, the Bills had the ball for over 40 minutes against the Miami Dolphins. They lose. This week, the Ravens, damn near 40 minutes, and the Bills win that game. You can never quite pinpoint how a game is going to go based on these stats. I said the same thing last week. If you looked at the Bills' numbers, you would have thought that they doubled up the Dolphins, but they wind up dropping that one. I think right now for the Ravens, because I looked at this game and the way that the weather was supposed to be, the way that they've been putting up points, the Bills' defense is banged up. It's funny how things pan out. The last thing I thought was going to happen here was that the Ravens' D was going to step up, especially in the first half the way they did, force two turnovers, score off of them, and then ultimately hold the, bo- the, the Bills to 23 points. I mean, even, even at the end of it, the fact that the Bills scored 23-1 and won is pretty wild. You look at what the Ravens yeah. have been doing on offense, and for this defense, Bobby, that the Baltimore Ravens currently possess, which they're getting roasted by everybody now. I know last night Rodney Harrison saying this might be the worst Ravens defense he's ever seen. I know that, and, and I get it, right? The Ravens defenses of old were so good. Anything other than that, you know, hey, else in comparison. Hey, maybe that was the video that did me in, huh? I put hey, that video be. up on Twitter watching Sunday Night Football, and maybe some Ravens fan got all pissed and hot and bothered at me and yeah. flagged it. And now my Twitter's violated. You know what? I wouldn't put it past Rodney Harrison either. That's a guy over here in Buffalo that. He, we know how much that guy can't stand us. And unfortunately yeah, yeah. for us, he, he beat us a couple of times with the New England Patriots. So I think the feeling might be a bit mutual there. That's why. But, <laughs> but with those Ravens, though, Bobby, and the thing that really stood out to me was the fact that this offense for the Baltimore Ravens, the way that they had been playing, what is it that you saw in particular? Maybe I'll, and I, I completely agree with you. Leslie Frazier has defended Lamar Jackson, I think, better than anybody has since he's gotten into the league. I don't know quite what it is. It doesn't seem like it's anything completely out of the ordinary. And like you mentioned, Matt Milano, I, I, he couldn't be having a better season right now if he tried. And one of the more underrated guys in all the league. I was so happy to hear Charles Davis on the broadcast yesterday say that because nobody outside of Buffalo, for the most part, unless you are really, really into football, most people don't know Matt. Matt Milano. If you've been watching him all year, the guy is playing some of the best football out of anybody on the defensive side of things in the entire league. But you set that aside because you look at what the Baltimore Ravens have done week in and week out. They've been scoring 30 plus at will. What is it that stood out to you in particular from the Ravens in this game that didn't allow them to get past that threshold of just 20 points when their defense, you could argue, did hold up their end of the bargain. And how do you see that affecting them going forward? Because us as Bills fans, we look at this game as obviously a crucial win for the current moment. But we're talking about way bigger things when we're thinking about the Bills and the Ravens. We're talking about one seed playoff positioning. The Ravens got to go take on the Bengals, who are now getting increasingly better as the weeks go on. It doesn't get easy for Baltimore. So is there a concern for you right now for the Baltimore Ravens that might stick out that could wind up burning them down the stretch based on what you've seen the last couple of weeks here? Yeah. Yeah. Offensively speaking, I'm not really concerned. Like you said, I think Leslie Frazier (laughs) – and just the discipline that the middle part of his defense has has taken when it comes to strategizing against Lamar Jackson has been second. It's been unmatched. Yeah, it's been second to none. You know, really. I mean, you know, again, you can put that Miami performance last year on Thursday Night Football up there, but Buffalo's done it repeatedly. Miami yeah. wasn't able to do it. You know, the uh, a couple weeks ago in Baltimore, so. I think offensively speaking, they're getting their feet from underneath them. J.K. Dobbins, as you saw, was not only in that first half, at least, was not only showing his burst and his his cutting ability and just overall how he looks rejuvenated coming off the torn ACL, but he was also getting involved as a pass catcher. And that's what we saw in his rookie season in 2020, where he led all running backs in yards per carry on in terms of average yards per carry. So again, and once they get the ground game going, which they haven't even done so yet, Lamar essentially has been their ground game. And once Gus Edwards gets back into the fray and they kind of have a two headed monster back there, we don't know what's going on with justice Hill who, uh, remember that, that, that play that he pulled up on, it was like a 16 yard run or 20 yard run yesterday. And 
like the last eight or last 10 yards was after pulling his hamstring and he just gutted it out. I love, yes. I love that. But um, it reminds me of the way Poirier played. I mean, Poirier was banged up all week long and yet yeah. he's the difference maker defensively for Buffalo. There's no question about that. So, and this is his contract year. You said the other night, right? So he's playing for big time for his life, you know, for his livelihood. I mean, he's sure. all these guys are making great money, but um, so again, offensively, I'm not worried defensively, dude, this is not a, this is unfamiliar in terms of what's expected when it comes to Baltimore Ravens defense. I mean, this is, dare I say putrid. I mean, seriously, Yeah. you know, the lack of pressure, the lack of consistent pressure, the inability to sack the quarterback, the inability to when plays break down, uh, limit the quarterback. I mean, you should have seen what Mac Jones was doing at times. He was looking like, yeah, you know, Lamar, it was looking like Lamar out there at times in Foxborough last weekend. So, you know, that's an issue. And and I think the secondary depth could come back to bite this team very much. So because after Marlon Humphrey and Marcus Peters two you know, pro bowl caliber cornerbacks, there's a lot of youth. There's a lot of inexperience and clearly there's been a lot of issues that are out there on tape and throughout the, the first four weeks of the season. So, yeah, uh, they got a lot of, an- you know, look, at the same time, we know how much parity is in the AFC. Sure. You know, there's at least five teams that can take it the distance, you would have to think. Uh, what Kansas City showed last night is like, oh, hey, hey, guys, you know, know. we're still here. We're Tyreekless, but it don't, it don't really matter because Kelsey's the best tight end in the league. Patrick's an absolute wizard. And uh, Andy Reid's kind of the one that's that's mixing and matching. So, you know, like I said, it's this is the most compelling and most evenly balanced and dangerous conference, man, in quite some time that I can remember when it comes to AFC football. So lots of concerns, but it doesn't mean they can't be there at the end, especially given sort of a lackluster division, inconsistent division. Yeah, I'm glad you bring that up because you got to think for your for, from your perspective, this game against Cincy is huge. I mean, the Browns losing to the Falcons, massive loss. You have to think that it's going to come down to the Bengals and the Ravens, this game coming up Sunday night, a massive game. And that's why, of course, yesterday was so big the way it went down because one or two plays go a different way, and that could be all the difference between the one seed all the way down to God knows what, depending on what pans out. I always love getting this perspective from people who are entrenched in another fan base and another team because we see Josh Allen as one way. We see him as our quarterback and the guy that we don't have to deal with. Everybody else has to deal with them. Now, I do think about this when I think of Mahomes and, of course, Lamar Jackson. I mean, how many plays yesterday did Lamar Jackson make, even though it was in a losing effort? But how many plays did he make where any other quarterback in the league gets sacked? He winds up getting out of trouble, getting the first down. That's why he was close to, yet again, another 100-yard rushing performance. So I understand to some extent what it's like to go against that. But it just seems at times, especially yesterday, throughout that comeback – Josh Allen and his ability to do quite literally everything. Unbelievable. Unlike the Ravens, who have an established run game to some degree and always really have, the Bills have not had one for years. It is only Josh Allen. So from your perspective and the pulse of the Ravens fan base, what was it like yesterday as you go up as much as you do, knowing, hey, yeah, we might be up 20 to 3. It's still Josh Allen they score right beho- before the half. What's the pulse like kind of going into half, knowing Josh Allen is still on that other side and there's still a full half left to go? Oh, well, I'll speak for, yeah, you know, certainly m- myself and, and some tweets that I saw and some social media reaction. But when the Ravens sort of failed to cash in before, you know, w- before they handed it back to Buffalo, who ultimately obviously scored before the half was over, and then to begin the second half with an interception, I think it was, at that point you're thinking to yourself, "Here we go again." You know, I mean, Josh is is capable of of obviously you know breaking hearts in in this type of situation, uh, but at the same time, you know, you're, you're thinking about that statistic, right? That they're trying to sort of overcome not having won a single digit regular season game since what do we say, December 2020? I think for. The Bills, it was, yeah, it was seven straight games. So if you do the math, yeah, I guess you're probably right. The thing that blew my mind, though, like we were just saying, is the fact that it it was the same for Baltimore. I had not realized that teams that you consider to be, 
you know, the team you'd bet on in that situation have not gotten it done in that stretch. And now you look at Baltimore, which I think is even more concerning, you know, four games this season in the NFL where a team has had a 17 plus point lead and blown it. That's the most already in a handful of years. We're already four games in or only four games in, but the, the Ravens have two of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, just to finish that thought too, about Josh Allen. I mean, it, this this fan base understands just how dynamic and lethal of a quarterback he is. I mean, they, they understood that, you know, not putting up points there at the end of the second quarter and then coming out of the, of the half with the interception and all of a sudden you're treading water still with a 17 point lead, you know? So like, uh, I just thought that the resolve that he showed individually in, in Josh's case and, you know, the perseverance in the middle of a monsoon in the second half to lead his team to victory, uh, you know, we already referenced the just spectacular scramble breakdown plays, somehow flushing out of the pocket, somehow getting away from Adafe Owe in Josh's case, and then whoever Lamar had to 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 sneak away from when he lofted up that 50-50 bobble ball between yeah. Andrews and then it handed, landed right in Duvernay's hands. And for, and for Josh to put forth a, a very similar play, and I think it was just a sort of a sidearm dart to whoever there was on the side. Was it Shakir on the, on the left-hand he, side there? I believe you're right. Yeah. And he made the move to wind up getting the first down. He looked dead to oh. right. Yeah. I mean, that was just sensational. He stops on a dime and just tr- absolutely sends a laser to Shakir right where it needed to be. Yeah. Um, so again, as Josh said, post game, let's hope these two are matching up, you know, as AFC elites for years to come, because it was an absolute treat. It didn't, you you know me. I don't lose sleep over wins, losses, ties, you name it. Sure. Um, I just don't because I didn't grow up a Ravens fan. And when I got into broadcasting before I got into content creation, I just stripped all of my all of my sports loyalty. So I'm not hurting as much as everybody else is yeah. in town today. I just thought it was a great football game and uh and one that I hope we see layers of for years to come. Because if so, we're all gonna be better for it. I mean, it's just Freaking awesome. I totally agree. I mean, how lucky are we to have those two guys to 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 watch, to analyze, to break down, root for? It's incredible. And that's why, you know, to see Lamar after the game tweet out, you know, good going. First of all, I love Lamar's Twitter. There's always something on there that's giving me a laugh. But I just loved seeing that because I love that these guys – what it seems to be, at least for the most part, they all seem to have a great relationship. These young and up and comers that are going to be the face of the league, if not already. So I do love that. Um, I know you got to run and do another show because, as you know, in the content world, it's a never ending cycle. So I'm going to let you balance. But before I do, the one other thing I wanted to touch on, because right when you joined, you had talked about penalties. And I know we could get into a million of them every week, but the one that I feel like the Ravens fans are still just losing sleep over today with is the Brandon Stevens roughing the passer call. Of course, for us in Buffalo, Hey man, whatever, man, we'll take it. The only thing I saw on it, Bobby, my take at least, and this is trying to be as unbiased as I can. He stopped and then re applied himself again. I think that's what drew the flag. Talk to me about what the Ravens fans are saying about that call, because you could really argue that that had a big impact towards the final outcome of this game late in the, late in the, uh, in the fourth quarter. Oh, no question about it. Uh, you know, fans lost sleep over that, and I apparently lost my Twitter account over that play. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, look, I, I think what what did it was, I don't know if it was, you know, I'm not going to call it a flop, but the fact that Josh Allen, you know, fell down and it was a bang-bang play, I think, it, and it was sort of aw- an awkward fall too. Oh, yeah. I think that's what added maybe some pressure on on Jerome Boger's officiating crew to 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 call that flag. Um, but you know, ultimately I'll lean on the experts, right? And Gene Sterator is exactly that for CBS. And his tweet essentially saying that, yeah, that was a hard hit on I'm I'm paraphrasing here, but that was a hard hit on Josh Allen, but the contact was neither late nor to the head neck area. Him falling awkwardly, which always adds an additional layer of difficulty for these plays is is obviously something that was taken into account but in my opinion again gene sterator here that did not warrant a flag for roughing the passer what sucks about it is that these guys are taught um, technique and discipline and when you do everything because we all know how much the rules have changed in the last decade in this category and when you do everything perfectly which apparently that's what brandon stevens did according to gene sterator 
and you still get flagged for it, that just blows. You know, that just blows. And it was obviously, again, like I said at the top, with John Harbaugh's decision to go for it on fourth and two, it helped decide the ultimate outcome of this game, but it didn't decide the game. And I, like I said, I think there's a difference between the two, and I think you can apply that to this situation as well. You know, um, hey, they had other penalties that hurt them as well that were controllable. This was out of their control. Right. This was a, a blatant error by Jerome Boger. The other ones, though, like the Linderbaum penalties and um, on the defensive side of the ball, Patrick Queen not being able to intercept that gift. And I know it was it, it was tough conditions out there and it slipped, whatever. Like the Ravens had their chances to cash in. And, and unfortunately, uh, they weren't able to do it. But yeah, uh, but yeah that one, uh, that, that definitely probably caused a good percentage of this fan base to lose a lot of sleep last night. Yeah, and I think that every year, no matter what, at some point in the season, it's going to happen to every team. Look at We'll take it all day of the week here in Buffalo. I know that for a fact and speak for everybody. But if it was the other way around, and that's the beauty of these things, it's always based on the perspective of, you know, who winds up getting quote-unquote screwed, so to speak. I mean, sometimes you win them, sometimes you lose them. But I think it comes back to what we were talking about earlier, Bobby. In games like this, yeah, you look at that call, you look at Harbaugh's decision, but there's so many things throughout the course of the game that you don't – often focus on because those few things stick out 20 to three lead, you know, bills last week, the ability to, to take, take it away from the, the dolphins multiple times, the Ravens up 35 to 14 against the, the dolphins could have won that multiple times. It, you just, it, it's hard to focus on it when you lose, but it's, it's true. You know, Hey, if you would have just done, you know, what got you to there at that point in the first place, you walk out of there with a win, but if it was that easy, I guess every team would go undefeated. So, Bobby, hey, thanks so much for your time as always. And I got a feeling, and tell this to the Ravens fan base when you do get out of Twitter jail, that I think we'll be seeing you again. And I would love to have you back on again when we inevitably wind up doing so. Before I let you rock out of here, let everybody know where they can find you so they can uh, cover the Ravens down the rest of the season here. Because like I said, I mean, they're not going anywhere. That's for sure. It's going to be Bills, Ravens, Chiefs at the top, just a matter of what the order is. I appreciate it, man. You know, it's good to that we could uh, sort of return a favor. You came on my pregame yes. show, and uh, I was happy to come on. I uh, come on your your review night here because uh, it was one of the best games all weekend. There's no no, no question about that. So yeah, like I said, uh, right before I came on, my Twitter uh, <laughs> I got suspended by the the powers that be apparently from yeah. I think the roughing the passer call that I tweeted out uh, without attribution or whatever. So. My bad there, Twitter gods. I, hopefully, I'll be back within 48 hours. But you can find me at Bobby Baltimore. I create daily content on my YouTube channel for all things Ravens and, and Orioles as well. You can just type in my name, like you said earlier on, Bobby, and it's actually Trossett, T-R-O-S-S-E-T. -S -S -E and then if you're interested in, uh, in following along with Daily Ravens News too, we do have a, a, a Ravens Vault podcast. That's what it's called, Ravens Vault, which is kind of funny. I mean, I know you guys know Greg Roman and you're part of the world. For sure. And he's joked throughout the years about his offensive vault and the fact that the vault – hasn't uh, essentially been revealed in full. And while it's come back to bite him a lot, the Ravens sort of drag him and troll him for that. Yeah. But we did decide to uh, name our podcast, the Ravens vault. So you can go check that out across uh, all your platforms, wherever you get your shows. So, Hey man, keep enjoying, uh, keep enjoying the ride. It's a hell of a team and it was a hell of a game. And I'm sure there's plenty more to come down the line. So here's to, Here's to a January reuniting. How about it? I agree. And hopefully one where there's better weather conditions. Cause when you got two quarterbacks yes. like that, you don't want to watch them play in the rain, but Hey, I'll be watching your stuff all week. Cause I'm stoked for that Ravens Bengals Sunday night. That should be a great one. So, Hey, keep crushing it. Thanks as always. And I'm sure we'll be linking back up sooner rather than later, my friend.